So just very quickly, we've been in this series, Strive. Striving is just this. It is struggling. It's fighting. It's learning how to do the hard things so that you will grow in your faith. You see, God is the kind of God that he loves you so much that he's going to allow you to face circumstances in your life that you would rather not face. And in the middle of those circumstances, he's going to help you to grow. He's going to help you to learn how to patiently endure, which is what we talked about the first week. Brad and I always illustrate this by talking about just simply sitting in the chair. When you learn how to patiently endure, what you're doing is you're learning how to get under God's provision. You're learning how to get under God's protection for your life, for your circumstances, so that you can come through that trial, come through that test approved, having passed the test. Last week and the week before, we talked a lot about you have to let go and have surrendered control to God in order for that to happen. You see, a lot of us, we want to hold on to the reins. And God is saying, you got to learn how to trust me. You don't really grow when you hold on to the reins and you try to let me and you both control your life. See, the only way you're really going to grow in your faith, the only way you're really going to grow is in your walk with God is if you surrender control to him completely. All right? So today is part four. Next week will be the grand finale. Probably is my going to be my favorite. So don't miss out on next week. Huh? So it's going to be really good. Yeah, it's going to be really good. It's probably my favorite. Each of the weeks are good, but next week, make sure you're here for the grand really, finale. Really, really, really good. Okay, so uh, I was driving this week, and I was praying about this series and about this message, uh, today's message, and it's like God kind of just whispered to me, and he said, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a few people in this series that have misinterpreted what it means to sit in the chair, to sit in their faith. And so he said, you need to bring some clarification as to what it means and what it doesn't mean. And so I I want to kind of bring to the table this morning this idea that um, faith, as we sit in the chair and we believe big that God is able to do anything, and can't he do anything? Is God capable? Is God able? He can do anything. There's nothing that God cannot do. But... uh, Our faith has to have action with it. Our faith, yes, we've been saying sit in the chair. We've been saying rest and be at peace in your faith and sit there like a bump on a log and don't do anything so that God can do something. But we're talking about not doing anything in faith. What I'm saying is, is spiritually speaking, sometimes just resting in your faith and believing that God can do it, that's the first step. But secondly, we make, so, we make this big mistake so often by, by forgetting that our faith requires action. Striving, wrestling through, uh, fighting the battle, believing big, it, it all takes trying on our part. That we have to give God our very, very best. When we're wrestling through our faith, it takes obedience, and many, oftentimes, it takes a lot of effort on our part. Say effort. It takes a lot of obedience and a lot of effort. Our faith has to have action with it. So we're going to clarify this morning by digging into uh, James chapter 2. And we've been talking to James here these last couple weeks, been hanging out with him. And we're going to go to chapter 2 today and pick up in this letter that he's writing to all of the Jews in his day. They were spread out all over the countryside. And here's what he says to them. And and I want to preface this by saying in his day, um, the culture, society was a little bit different when it came to people that were in need. Uh, In his day, women weren't allowed to work. Okay, Uh, this was a cultural thing, especially widows. If they had no husband, they would starve to death. If somebody didn't step in and help them, if if you were an orphan and you didn't have parents and nobody adopted you, you were going to starve to death. If you had a physical impairment of some kind, if you were blind or you were lame somehow and you couldn't work, then you would starve to death. So the church got really, really involved and really engaged in the culture of the day and society. And they said, we are going to distribute food and clothing like crazy, and we're going to help those people that can't help themselves. And so James is, he is on a soapbox. He is really ticked off because there's so many people out there calling themselves Christians, but there's no action behind their faith. They're saying, I'm a person of faith, but I'm not going to help at all. 
with giving towards helping people to have food or clothing or shelter when they need it the most. So he's like, you hypocrites, don't, don't say that you're one thing, but, but you don't have anything to back it up whatsoever. And then he wraps it, he, he brings it back around, and he talks about faith in action. This is so good. Let's pick up here in verse 14. He says, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your action? Man, he's getting on him. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister that has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm. Eat well. Basically, he was saying best wishes. I'm praying for you. Hey, hope all is well. Hope you stay warm tonight out there with no blanket, no place to stay. But you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? He says faith by itself isn't enough. Here's what he was saying. Sitting in the chair and being super spiritual Spencer... And believing that it's all going to be okay. I'm just going to believe by faith. It's all going to be fine. I'm going to lay my head on my pillow at night. Being a person of faith. And I'm going to believe, God, you're going to meet those needs. You're going to feed those people. You're going to just help them to have shelter and a blanket tonight. Not going to be through me. But you're going to use somebody to help those people to be warm tonight. And make sure they have full bellies when they go to bed. Not going to be me. But it's going to be somebody. Just send that person. God, won't you just send somebody? Won't you just send them tonight? It doesn't mean that we don't have action with our face. He says, unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Say useless. Verse 18, he says, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. He says, good for you. So do the demons in hell. They believe that there's one God and God is good all the same. So do the demons in hell. But, and, and how foolish is this? Can't you see that faith without works, without good deeds is absolutely and completely useless? Say useless. Verse 21. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Okay. If you don't know who Abraham is. In the last series we did, we talked about how God established a covenant with humanity, a bloodline by which Jesus was able to come through. Abraham is that guy that God chose. He said, I'm going to pick a lineage of a people. I'm going to give birth to the nation, the children of Israel through this guy. That's Abraham. And Abraham asked, was asked by God to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on top of the mountain. And this is what he's referring to. He's saying Abraham had to have action with his faith. That's why he grabbed his son and he grabbed the wood. He grabbed everything he needed to make the sacrifice. And he walked all the way up the hill ready to do what God asked him to do. And you might be saying to yourself, why would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? How screwed up and messed up is that? Why would he do that? Well, listen, it was a picture of what Jesus was about to do by, by God giving his son to die on the cross on top of that hill called Mount, um, the skull of the, what is it? Uh, Golgotha. Sorry. Okay. Hey, so side note, can I just throw in just for well, this Well, sure. Go for it. It was the exact same hill same that hill. Abraham went up that Jesus was crucified on. So if you didn't know that, it's pretty cool when you see God does something in the Old Testament foreshadowing what's going to happen in the New, and that was what was happening there. We need to preach that. That's a good message. (laughs) Verse 22, he says, you see his faith and his actions worked together. I love this part. If you have your Bible, underline this. It says his actions made his faith complete. Isn't that good? His actions made his faith complete. Our actions make our faith complete complete. It's one thing to say that you believe God. You're believing God so big. It's another thing to prove it with your actions. Verse 23, he says, and so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God, listen to this, counted him as righteous. Say righteous. He was saying, Abraham, you are a man that is in right positioning with me. Why? Because of his faith. Because of his faith, he was even called the friend of God. How many of you guys want that title? In your relationship with God. I want to be called a friend of God. So you see, verse 24. We are shown to be right with God. Who wants to be right with God? By what we do, not by faith alone. So we have to have faith. We also have to have action. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Let me give you a really practical illustration here. Some of you in this room 
just because it's life. You might be struggling in your marriage, okay? You might be having some real struggles. You might be really striving in your marriage. You might be really wrestling through this battlefield trying to make your marriage work. Now, faith would just sit in the chair and say, you know what? I'm just going to believe that God is going to bless my marriage. And I'm just going to sit in this chair with all the faith I can possibly have. And I believe by the power of Almighty God that my marriage is just going to be healed. And there's nothing I need to do but just sit in this chair. Now what you need to do is go get yourself some counseling. (laughs) What you need to do, uh, men, is you need to start getting in the Word of God with your wife. This is the action with the faith. Yes, sit in the chair. Yes, believe that God, because God can heal your marriage. He can. He's able. He can do it. But start praying with your wife. Take her on a date, okay? Love her. And seriously, get some counseling. If you need counseling, then do it. And that's the work in combination with your faith. You, you can't just sit in the chair and believe that God's just going to do it for you. There has to be some action with it. You have to take whatever effort is necessary to step out and say, I'm going to give God my very, very, very best to make this marriage the best it can be so he can be glorified through us. And so our kids can see us as an example. I'm going to do everything I can. And then God takes that little bit of effort and he blesses the rest of it. He says, okay, I'm going to pick it up from here where where you left off. You give me your very best. You do whatever you can do within your power. You you really, really have to try while you strive. Put your faith with action while you're sitting in the chair and just watch me go and watch what I do. So some of you may be asking, but how do I know what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Because even in that example, if your marriage is struggling, you need to do something. But how do you know what the right thing is to do? Because for some people, you know, you said, Brad, you know, read the Word of God together, which is awesome if you both believe in the Word of God. But what happens if you're married to someone who you married prior to coming to know Christ yourself and they don't even believe in God? right? So that advice might not work for you. So how are you going to know what to do? And marriage is just one example. You could be having a financial situation. You could have a health situation. You could have any number of trials in your life because the fact is you're going to face these micro trials, just these little bitty ones all the time. Then you're going to have some macro trials in your life. These ginormous, almost sweep your feet out from underneath your faith kind of moments. All right. So you have to ask yourself, how do I know what the action is God wants me to do? Well, James talks about that as well. Go back to James chapter one, verse five. And it says this, if you need wisdom, say wisdom, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, listen, generous God, that's who he is is. It's not what he does. It's who he is. You see, whatever circumstance you're going through or you're going to go through in a trial, God already knows what you need to be doing. All right. Yes. You got to have faith supernaturally, spiritually minded, sitting in faith, believing God to move, but he knows what the action is you need to take, but you need to ask him. Sometimes we ask everybody, but him. We call up all our friends. We even get on social media. We blast it out there for the world's advice, which, you know, take it and leave it. You know, I'd probably leave it. You know what I'm saying? But we don't ask the one who knows what the future holds. He knows whether you should take that job. He knows whether you should make that move. He knows whether you should buy that car or marry that girl or whatever it is. He already knows. Ask the one. Who knows? And it says that he's a generous God and he gives liberally to those who will ask. It goes on to say, he will not rebuke you for asking. You see, the fact is God's not going to get frustrated with you that you ask. He wants you to ask and keep on asking until you get the answer. So the first thing you're going to have to do when you're striving and trying is just simply this. If you're taking notes, write it down. Ask God for directions. And I'll add this. First, before you get advice from everybody else in the world, ask God first. Now, you need to understand something. Nine times out of ten, what God will ask you to do won't even make sense. He will ask you to do things that are uncomfortable. 
He'll ask you to do things that you would rather not do. You know, if you read in the Old Testament, you can go from beginning to the end of the word. And when you begin to read, you see these stories. I think about a story in the Old Testament where there was a guy named Nahum. And he needed healing in his body. And he comes to the prophet. And he tells him, go to the Jordan River and dip seven times in the water. Okay? The Jordan River was dirty. And in his mind, he's thinking, why do you want me to go dip in the Jordan? Why can't I go dip in that beautiful spring over there that's clear? And he asks them this. And he's thinking to himself, and he's talking to another one of his friends. And he says, but if it would heal you, wouldn't you just do it? And he's like, I guess you're right. And he did it. And he was healed. But you know what? A lot of times we want it to make sense, and we want it to be easy. And that's not how God rolls. Most of the time, when he begins to speak, it doesn't quite make sense. It kind of stretches you a little bit. I mean, go to four services, sell something, do something crazy, go get counseling, lay your junk out in front of somebody else. You know what I mean? All of it, it doesn't make any sense. But if you'll just take that step of faith, put your faith into action, you'll begin to see that God supernaturally begins to work. So the second thing you're going to do after you ask God for wisdom, after you ask him for directions, is you're going to have to just obey. You've got to put your faith in to action. And I'll back up and I'll say this. For some of you guys, you may be asking yourself like, I hear what you're saying. I can ask God for wisdom, but I've never really heard God speaking to me. Okay. And I get that. And I want to kind of help you illustrate this really easily, really quickly. Brad, will you go over in the corner? Yes, ma'am. You've been told that a few times in your life, haven't you? (laughs) You heard I said, boy, (laughs) take notes. Right. Okay. Because so we're going to Branson. Oftentimes, oftentimes in right. our life, Brad and I will be in the same room and we'll be talking and one of us will leave the room, but the other person continues to talk. And generally it's me because in my mind I'm thinking, I honestly can hear you. Even though she knows I'm half deaf. I know. But for me, I can hear my kids in the other end of the house just when they're whispering because they had a sleepover, okay? Last night, I mean, I had like two extras. The night before, I had like three extras. They're in the other end of the house, and I'm texting them. I can still hear you go to bed, okay? But that's not Brad. So for Brad and I, he leaves the room. I'm still talking. He goes out, and then he makes this comment from the other room. Hey, if you're still talking, I can't hear you, right? And so I'm like, ugh. And I really do that. And I'm like, okay, babe, this is what I'm saying. Because generally it's in the morning and I'm trying to lay out. Here's all four of your kids. Here's all their schedules. This is all the games. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. But listen, he can't hear me when I'm this far away from him. You can come back. Okay. Come over here. Okay. What I need to do is I need to make sure that I get close to him if I want him to to hear me. And the fact is, a lot of times in our relationships with God, we are miles apart. We are miles away from God. But yet we're saying, Lord, if you'll just speak to me. And he's like, and I just need you to get a little closer. Because see, I've been speaking all along, but you're way too far away from me to actually hear me. See, the word talks about that he will talk to you in a still, small voice. That's like a whisper. That means you got to get right here. Get up close. How do you do that? And God's not going to come to you. Nuh-uh. He's not going to come in from the other room nope. and come to you. He wants you to come to him. That's right. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary, heavy laden, That's right. burdened, broken down, and I will That's give right. you rest. He says, come to me. Come to I me. used to do that to my mom. I would yell, mom, from the other end of the house. She's like, if you want something, <laughs> you need to come to me. I'm not going to come to you. I'm like, come. Oh. You know, because we're lazy. Yeah. I mean, honestly, human nature. But in our relationship with God, He's not yes. going to come to you. He wants yeah. you to go to Him. That's right. So here's a quick little way that you can do it. Okay, for you that are saying, you know what, I feel like that. I'm miles. I'm miles apart from God. I would challenge you to do this. Take the 15 minute challenge. This is so simple. We've been teaching this for so long. <laughs> but so many people miss it. They do. It's huge. And although my time frames look different, this is exactly what I do every single day of my life, every day, I open God's word and I spend time reading it. And I'm challenging you just five minutes. That's like one chapter, maybe even less, or grab a version Bible plan and go through it. Five minutes, turn on a worship song, something you enjoy, something that's ministering to you in the moment, and that will usher in God's presence. It's another message, but the Bible says that worship ushers in God's presence to where you are. And, and then spend five minutes praying, and you think, that's a long time. It's really not. 
It's really not. And don't just talk the whole time. I would encourage you to spend just a few minutes, maybe two or three talking, and then just sit in silence. And if you will do this over and over and over, the distance between you and God will begin to decrease because the Bible says that when you take a step towards God, he takes a step towards you. And all of a sudden, you will begin to hear God's still small voice. You'll begin to hear him give you direction. You'll be reading, and all of a sudden, it will be like something pops off the page. And he begins to deal with your heart to say, this is an area you need to work on right here. And this morning, we want to share with you, just very transparently, what God's been dealing with us about in our own lives and how God spoke to us about getting up and taking some action in our life. So our battle uh, recently was a financial battle because as we... Months ago, back in, uh, I think, October, November um, of last year, you know, we brought to you this building project, and we started challenging ourselves as a, as a, a church family to begin praying and seeking God as to what our financial contributions would be to this building. And Misty and I, having, you know, huge hearts to want to see God's kingdom grow, you know, we dedicate this amount that's way beyond what we can do. And we knew that. And it broke our hearts because um, we so desperately wanted to give way beyond ourselves. But there was some, some things that were holding us back, and it's called debt, okay? Uh, you may not know what that is, but it's, it's called debt. It's every month beyond your, your mortgage payment or beyond your, uh, your, your food and your utilities and all that. There's these things called payments that you make to other people because you've somehow borrowed money because you didn't have money in the first place. So we... we we, it sounds crazy, actually, sounds when crazy. you say it the way that you just did. Okay, but the, we but, understand. So we, here we are in this position, and after years of planting the church, we're realizing all of our teenagers are going into high school, and we haven't been on that many vacations. And so we're about to, like, we need to make some memories fast, and we need to make this happen before we blink our eyes, and all of our kids are gone, and we don't want to have any regrets. And so we're like, God, you know, we just poured our, heart before, our hearts out before the Lord and said, God, we want to take our kids on vacations. We want to get this debt paid off so we can live generously. His word says that we're not to be slave to the lender, okay? His word says that in Proverbs. His word also says it's better to give than it is to receive. We wanted to give so desperately to be able to give and give and give, but we just weren't in a position to do that. We had these restrictions because of those stupid monthly payments. So we made a dedication before the Lord and said, God, um, and, and here's, here's where we made the mistake. For a long time, we sat in the chair and said, God, you are able, you can perform a financial miracle in our lives Man, we were, we were returning the tithe to God, which is huge. But we were just sitting in the chair. And we're saying, by faith, we just believe, God, that you're going to just pour out supernaturally the finances on our family so that we can get out of debt and remodel our home and go on some vacations and give really big to this building project. God, just bless us, Lord. Bring the money supernaturally. All right, so then we, some time goes by, and we're praying. We're sitting in the chair, but not much is happening and I'm just getting really frustrated and aggravated. And I'm like, I'm sick and tired of sitting in this chair. Nothing's happening, okay? And God deals with my heart. We do this series, not too long ago, we did this series. And we talked about uh, Elisha the prophet and the widow woman. And her sons were going to be, she owed a huge debt. Her husband had died. Her sons were going to go into slavery to pay for the debt. And she's like, I don't know what to do. The man of God comes and says, hey, what do you have? What can you do. And he says, hey, go around town, go door to door, go around the neighborhood collecting jars, all right? Get some jars, and God's going to do something. If you don't know the story, God supernaturally filled the jars with oil, and she was able to sell the oil and pay, not only pay off all of her debt, but she lived on it for the rest of her life and bought her sons out of slavery. So God brings this message to my attention. We brought that message to you because God was speaking to us as a church that he was giving us another jar, that's this room, to go to a fourth service. But I'm driving, and he says, hey, guess what? I'm like, what? He's like, you, you tired of sitting in the chair? I'm like, yeah, I'm tired of sitting in the chair. You want something to happen in your finances? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you want to have faith? I've got faith. He's like, well, you need to get to action. He said, what do you have? I'm like, what do I have? What do I have? And I start thinking about jars. I'm like, oh, I don't know. What, what jars do I have? And so I got to preface this by saying for months, 
Misty had been urging me, hey, why don't we, why don't we clean out the, the shop? Let's go get all that stuff and let's clean it up and take pictures of it and upload it to Facebook and, and sell all this junk. And I, th- and I was really giving her pushback big time. I was like, first of all, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to clean Secondly, out my shop. I don't want to clean out the shop. Uh, third, I don't want everybody to see my crap on Facebook. And fourth is it's not going to bring enough money to do anything. It's not going to put a dent in our debt. It's not going to matter that we would do that. But see what Misty, maybe she realized, maybe she didn't realize, that was our faith in action. We could do something. There's something that we could do. It may not bring enough money to totally bail us out, but it's something. It's a way that we can put our faith in action. So I'm dri- she's been trying to get me to do this for months. I'm driving along, and God says, you've got jars. They're out in the shop. Go get them. Get up off your rear end, not in your faith, but your real rear end, and go to the shop and start dusting stuff off and take pictures of it. It's going to take, I know it's going to kill you. It's really hard to swallow, but it's going to take work. <laughs> It's going to take you actually doing something yourself so that I have something to work with. You see, she got jars. She went and pounded on every door in the neighborhood. She went to work getting jars. And then God took the next step and said, I'll take it from here. I'm going to fill the jars up with oil. Watch me go. So that's what we did. So I came home and I busted the front door open and said, honey, we're selling everything. (laughs) Everything's for sale. So I start taking all of our crapla uh, out of the shop and start dusting it off and taking pictures and uploading it to Marketplace. And I'm like, I know everybody thinks I'm crazy, all my stuff that nobody wants. The first thing that sells is a $15 plastic shelf. I'm like, sweet, 15 bucks, 15 bucks. Actually, you weren't saying that because you had to meet the lady in town and you were like, you're kidding. I'm going to drive into Grove for 15 bucks. This is ridiculous. I actually wasn't going to share that part. I'm just saying. Um, I just thought we'd be transparent. But since we're being really honest today, thank you, honey. Because not any of them ever have a bad attitude That's right. or anything like, like no, that. No, I was very perturbed because it was very inconvenient, and I did not have time to meet this lady to go get $15. What's that going to do? All right, so, so I go meet the lady, and she hands me. All right, follow, I'm kind of slow with math and numbers and money, but you follow me. It's $15. She hands me a 20 and says, do you have change for a 5? I'm like, ah, no. Tip number one, when you go to sell something, don't bring change with you. Just saying. That's terrible. That's one little technique. So I didn't have five bucks. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 20 bucks <laughs> for a plastic shelf. So she said, so then, then, then you got to pay attention. You're going to miss it. Then she hands me an extra hundred on top of it and says, keep the change. I said, what? I said, wait, my math's not good. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> I took algebra twice. <laughs> I said, all right, you handed me like an extra hundred and something. All right. So, uh, why did you do that? And she said, honestly, she said, um, God told me to do that. She said, I was, I was figuring my finances this morning at the kitchen table and I was setting all, you know, I had an extra hundred dollars and, and God said, I want you to set that aside. I've got somebody I want you to give that to. No joke. And she said, when I, sorry, hold on one second. (laughs) Shut up. Okay. Um, she said, when I looked on Facebook and I saw the plastic shelf, God said, that's the guy. And, and she handed me that money and you know, it, it it didn't put a dent in what we owed to pay off all the debt. But the first thing, man, we just took a little step. It was a $15 shelf guys. It was a step (laughs) to say, God, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to put my faith in action. God, just you Take it and do something with it. She hands me 120 and says, keep the change. God told me to give that to you. Blew my mind. I was like, man. I went home and I said, honey, we are going to sell everything that we own. (laughs) Everything is for sale. Everything is for sale. So then the next day. So the very next day I go out to the mailbox. And that was honestly just God because we did not want to do this. Okay. It took Bring we didn't our have pride. time to do it. We didn't have time, number one. 
Number two, we didn't want to humble ourselves and do something like this, okay? So that was just God-like. So both of us got fired up. We're like, hey, oh, yeah, this buddy. is God. This is obviously God. He's going to do something big. Next day, I go out to the mailbox, and there is a refund check from our mortgage company. And that refund check was because all year long, they had been charging us too much. So they refund that money to us, okay? And all of this, understand, here's the trick, boys and girls. Get an envelope, put debt on it, and all of that money, put it in that envelope, okay? Don't go take yourself out to dinner. So all that money was going in debt. Okay. And so at the same time I go out, that happens the very next day we go out to get in the van and there's this envelope duct taped to the, to the glass on the window of the van. We take it off. We open it up. There's three $100 bills. Okay. The whole time we're going in and we're telling our we're like, kids, kids, wake up. We're like, you guys need to understand what God is doing. This is what God told us. This is what we're doing. Look how God is supernaturally moving. That weekend, Brad had been trying to sell his truck because, honestly, that was one of the things God said, you can let it go. He loved love this old truck. Ford truck that he had. He loved it. So when he posted that for sale, I was like, this is huge because for him to give that I up is pretty it amazing. high on purpose. He, pra- he priced it, it high. Sell. The guy shows up. Guys, this all happened spring break week. From Monday to Saturday, all of it happened in one week. And he sells it, and the guy doesn't ask him to come down off Can his price it? at all. Real no, quick. we're out yeah. of time. Okay, we're out of time. So anyway, he walks <laughs> around the car, looks at all the tires, and he drives it for about 10 minutes, comes back, and he hands me all the money. And I said, I, I like to think I'm a decent salesman, but you I said something are, really stupid. Day. I said, don't you want to negotiate? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> like, and he said, should I? And I said, no. <laughs> so I took all of his money, and I was like, go, God. After that, so God now our just, sweet minivans for sale. If anybody wants to buy, this it. is true. <laughs> After that, he bought another truck and he sold that, and he bought another truck and he sold that. And in the meantime, God sold all—not all—he sold a lot of the little things. Guys, I want to tell you, we had six debts we needed to pay off besides our home. We've paid four of the six in since March 18th. Since March 18th, that is two months. Give God a hand. That's huge. We don't even have time to tell you all the little crazy things, but here's what I want you to know is, you know what? Whatever God speaks to you, whether it's relational, whether it's financial, whether it's healing in your body, whatever the trial is that you're facing, when you ask him for direction and he says, here's what you do, it's not always going to make sense. Actually, it's rarely going to make sense. But nine times out of 10, what we do is we want to negotiate with God. It's kind of like Eve. Like, did God really say don't eat that fruit? When you negotiate with God, you don't get the supernatural blessing that he wants to pour out by you just trusting him and putting your faith in action. All right. Guys, here's, here's the deal. Sit in faith, but striving takes trying. Okay? Sit in faith, but get up and do something. Whatever you have to do, put your faith into action. Give your very best. Take that first step. Give him your best, and he will do the rest. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you our faith. Uh, I pray that you would unveil to each and every one of us as we're striving through our battles currently. Show us what it means. What does it mean on our battlefield right now, in this season, in this situation? What does it mean for us to sit in the chair but get to work, God, with our actions? What does it mean to try while we strive? What does it mean for our faith to have action with it? What does that look like in our situation? I pray that you give us, as a church, a hunger for your word to get in your presence, to pray, to seek your face. And we know, God, that you have so much wisdom. You will download. You will speak to us as we try while we strive. With heads bowed and eyes closed, are you in this place today and you just feel God tugging at your heart and he's saying, hey, I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to make heaven your home. If that's you today, I want to encourage you to make that decision. Admit, like I've done, that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess Him as Lord of your life and just begin living for Him one day at a time. If that's you today, nobody's looking around. I want to know who I'm praying for. We want to, who, want to know who we're praying with today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where you're sitting right now so I can see who you are? Come on. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else today? I see your hand in the back. Anybody else today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Father. So this church loves to pray this prayer with you as a sign of support and love for you as you make this decision. So church, let's pray this prayer together. Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him as Lord of my life. Help me to live for you, God. Help me to sit in the chair. 
Help my faith to have action. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate with you. We've got a gift for you. It's called our Next Step Kit. It's in a green bag. By the double doors, you can pick one up as you exit. And I just want you to know that we are, are rooting for you. We want to help you on this newfound journey because God wants to bless your life. He wants you to take that step of faith, and that's your first one. Will you put your hands together this morning for those who have just made that decision? Thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.